Hey everyone, welcome to the next Chibcast. In this one we're going to be discussing how to defeat a necromancer. And we're here with It's Ghost UK. Hello. Jinx. A pleasure. Mr. Spook. Hey. And so high for hentai. Bibbidi bobbidi boo, I'm gonna raise you. <laughs> awesome. So to kick this off, I think we should begin with like tactics to avoid conflict because I personally think the best way to defeat a necromancer is to not let them build up steam in like the first place. So I think like if you're like a paladin society or whatever, you don't want to be having things like graveyards. You don't want to be burying corpses. You probably want to be cremating everyone so that there's no uh, fuel for a necromancer to fight you. What do you guys think about that? Uh, I think the biggest problem is it fails to realize that animal corpses exist. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's it's two things. Animal corpses exist as well as uh, like just spirits in general are a fucking thing. There might be somebody who doesn't want to be uh, just buried or cremated or some other weird shit. And then Nick Mage just says, oh, hey. Not any of that. Uh, go on. Assumedly, it wouldn't be a choice. Yeah, but that could piss off whoever it was and, you know, can create lingering remnants that Necromat could just say, yeah, I'm taking that shit and running. I suppose it depends if, if this is a society-based thing, uh, if they are actively at war with a Necromancer. Because if they are, then they could mandate, you know, due to the fact that you are all ammunition for this Necromancer, we mandate that you have to be cremated. It's still not going to vibe with everyone, though. There's still going to be uh, some motherfuckers who's going to be angry about that. That's just oh, absolutely in general. Do you think people would like go around with corpse carts and like pay for corpses and then dispose of them properly? Bring out your dead. Bring out your dead. Yeah, exactly. I'm trying to think. I don't trust anyone who's buying the corpses. They're That's probably very true. Answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, Necromancer Society, I've got. I'm. Um, still working with sort of developing like you do get rogue necromancers but the best way that people sort of go about it is they don't send people to t- tackle the necromancers because of course if, if you're dead then you're gonna be used against your friends they do is they just use some they just use a special group of uh, people that have died and their souls have been put in armor but they've got an incredible amount of willpower with them so if a necromancer were to control one, it would be really, really difficult. And with it being a soul, uh, it will be fighting for control all the time. So even if it was controlled, the necromancer, you know, won't be able to hold on to them for long. Or if they do, it's going to be something that's going to really keep them busy. Yeah, that makes it does. It- it doesn't it doesn't work so it's because i mean it once everything can die so unless you throw a tree at unless you throw a tree at one i'm trying to think you could also do like the age-old thing of demons versus undead i say age-old that's just basically worse uh, um the thing- because just like demons typically they uh, when they die or at least most medium they just go back to whatever realm they are or just turn into dust there's literally nothing for the next match to use once you throw a demon at them yeah, like elementals as well, probably. Mm. Yeah, just basically guys who can summon things instead of requiring a body to do it. You probably also need a large amount as well, though, because summonings apparently they're stronger, but the cost of less quantity. Another thing as well is that you could have a fantasy race that either doesn't leave behind the body when it dies, or a fantasy race that is immune or is incredibly difficult to reanimate. In in Warhammer, for example, like um, if you're playing Greenskins and you talk to Kemler, Kremler, Kemler, um, he talks about how th- it's. I swear, it's, I swear, he says something about how Greenskins are usually hard to work with, but he can reanimate them just fine. Yeah, he does say that. I remember it too. And after he says that, I can't help but think to myself, "Wait a minute! I don't think an undead Greenskin." <laughs> I wonder, so, I'll look that up actually. What about like blessed graves and stuff that are full of holy energy and just can't be used? A lot of the times, uh, at what like in real life, that's actually what a lot of uh, I believe Christian churches 
had parishioners do. They came around to grave sites and blessed them specifically so that, well, in their case, it was so that demons couldn't mess with the bodies and thus the souls or whatever. Wasn't, um, there, wasn't there also a thing wherein uh, people would bury a dog alive with, with, with the belief that the spirit of the dog would guard the graveyard from evil spirits and necromancers and whatnot? That sounds like something insane yeah. enough to believe in the Middle Ages. Yeah. <laughs> that does sound believable. I've never heard of it, but I believe it. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll Google it. I'll Google it. I guess they could also. Yeah, I think there's also like a. Oh, there you go. Oh, sorry. Um, I guess you could well, also do things like stake the heart so that they can't. Ah, uh, yes, the classic vampire tactic. Yeah. I mean. Here we go. If here you go. If you think about it, oh sorry. Oh uh, no, go go on. And if you think about it, if a guy tries to regenerate but has a literal piece of wood through hit, impaled through his ar- uh, heart, I don't think he can do much. Yeah. For the blessed graveyards, I think you'd have to view it from the countermeasure. If a necromancer, right, he's staging a full stage war, right. I think you'd then see him just going into smaller villages that are less protected and killing the people there for his body supply. If all the graveyards are already like unusable true yeah i'm trying to remember there is like a certain anime where uh if a person dies you basically have to go and pay the church or someplace or whatever to give them a proper burial because otherwise like since the, like the entire soul has been like tainted for some fucking shit the if they die and they're not properly buried for a set number of days they'll just rise back as a zombie yeah I, i've heard of stuff like that before somewhere yeah. Do you no, guys isn't that? Your... I was gonna say when it comes to. Oh, sorry, go on. Uh, no, I was about to say I'm not just too sure of how that worked too much, but yeah. Oh, uh, I was gonna say two things. One, with how uh, like holy religious stuff, it's all about sanctifying and blessings and whatnot. Can't necromancers desanctify and blight or curse or? get an area to be rife with necromantic stuff yeah it's, i feel like they could it's basically the question of uh is a necromancer in just all terms of strength personally stronger than whoever blessed it in the first place i'd say that it's more of a um it, uh, uh, using a ne- uh, necromantic curse on say a graveyard i'd say is an offensive action as uh, well as let's say some kind of priest or paladin or whatever um protecting an area with, say, a magical rune or something, that's more of a defensive tactic. So at that point, it becomes if they kill the priest or paladin or whoever, uh, then that rune then gets taken away. And then at that point, then he can place an appropriate curse upon the area. Um, And so it might just end up being that if a certain paladin loses a big war, then the situation becomes far worse because that paladin in particular was the one responsible for sanctifying all these graveyards. And then after this has happened, uh, an appropriate curse can be put upon uh, an area and that ends up causing massive amounts of new troops for the necromancer. Something like that, I believe, actually happened in uh, Diablo Free's story um, in the reaper of souls expansion where um the antagonist of the story essentially creates a curse upon an area upon an entire city and it meant so that it it was essentially a giant area of effect spell that continuously raised the dead whenever they went down so that eventually it started with just a small amount of people in the graveyards getting up and then as they killed people more people were added to the ranks and then it just progressed until the city was completely taken over i was gonna say um in some fantasy when it comes to undead like naturally appearing it's i mean there was this one there's this one anime i remember it was like an isekai one and i can't tell you the whole name but it had i think it was like grimgar or something like that yeah that's that i was thinking of grimgar fantasy and ash that's where the one there where if you die and you're not properly buried you just go undead yeah yeah it's like oh yeah we, we need to once you die we need to do this we need to do the there's that and um dragon's dogma has it where at night time undead will come out and do their stuff and then disappear during the day what i was thinking of could it be a case where the necromancer would have a designed or 
artificial well i mean curses are artificial but have have a purpose towards a curse as in say he curses or pro or profanes or does some ho horrible stuff to a graveyard yeah the undead could rise from it and following a new directive given by the curse or given by whatever he's done to it he or she has done to it the undead could then go towards the necromancer to await further orders or they could or they could go to a specific area and kill people or they could linger around or they could do this or they could do that bring the resources to them mm. um yeah, so with the uh, with the thing with the ch uh, with the church dog that's being buried, so the church grim is a guardian spirit in English and Scandinavian folklore. That does not surprise me in the slightest. That oversees the welfare of a particular Christian church and protects the churchyard from those who would profane and commit sacrilege against it. It often appears as a black dog, but is known to take the form of other animals. So in English folklore, uh, it usually takes the form of a big dog, God's churchyards, etc., etc., etc. It's a uh, so the Grim, according to Yorkshire tradition, is also an ominous portent and is known to toil, uh, toll the church bell at midnight before a death takes place. Um, here we go. It says, when a new churchyard was opened, it was believed that the first person buried there had to guard it against the devil in order to prevent a human soul from having to perform such a duty. A black dog was buried in the north part of the churchyard as a substitute. According to a related belief in Scotland, the spirit of the person most recently buried in the churchyard had to protect it until the next funeral provided a new guardian to replace him or her. This churchyard vigil was known as the Fair... Fair... I'm not even going to pronounce that. Or, <laughs> or Graveyard Watch. Uh, a folk tale of the Devil's Bridge type is also an example of the motive of a dog being sacrificed in place of a, of a human being etc 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 the is devil that, is that name uh, an old celtic name it's well the one i'm not the one pronounce. your unpronounceable one it's i'm gonna write it let me write it down it, yes write, write it down i i i could possibly pronounce it feared clerk a feared clerk <laughs> Fair click. Nice. Fair click. Alright, guys. Do you want to move on to the next point? Huh. Alright. Mm. Um, there's two things I'd like to mention with this for the for defeating a necromancer. One is time. Time is a necromancer's best friend. And two, geography. So how could geography help? Okay, um, so castles will, like, let's take castles for example. If uh, we've got castles, watchtowers, um, ruins, places that are, places that can be abandoned, dilapidated, in states of disarray, stuff like that, these places would be perfect bases for a necromancer to set up. And castles do tend because of how they are they do tend to be really good geographic positions wherein getting to them is awkward and difficult so if you're going to get to a castle that say on top of a hill um overlooking some like let me send you a picture of some castles just by if, if i google castles and let's look at so you've got Ones like these, for example, where they the way that they will be built, they will be built in an in a position advantageous because of the geography and because of the what's around them. So they'll be on top of like really awkward positions to get to. They'll be in uh, places with tons of water that's hard to access, stuff like that. Besieging a castle can be arduous and it can take ages depending on how you do it. And the castles will also have quite a few like they'll have defenses but they'll also have like back doors and secret entrances and exits and whatnot to guarantee that people can still get resources supplies for you know stuff like that information and I whatnot think, i think undead have a unique advantage in siege because they can pretty much just wait forever mm. and that's that's it the only the only real problem you have to the only real thing you have to take care of is the necromancer but because it's one person it's not a castle full of people each eating food every day. It's a ne one singular person that can wait for ages. And depending on the kind of fantasy, it could even be that if it, if that if that necromancer is a cannibal with a fresh supply of bodies, 
and the bodies are being well preserved, then not very good. Even better of a situation could be if they're a lich, because in that case, there's literally mm. no way you can win them through a war of attrition. Yeah. So there's so there's that, but there's also the case where as well, wherein so in like these pictures of sin, um, you can see on the first one that there's uh, sheep. The second one that there's tons of woods. The third one there's like it's in it's in a mountain. Uh, it's it's built into the mountain. So there will be animals and there will be things around where and that will provide food. Even if they even if the commander does not have human bodies, they can still get animal bodies. And they can still have agents patrolling around, providing information, the insight. I mean, if a necromancer, like, depending on how it works, if a necromancer has it, wherein they know everything that their undead knows, they see what their undead see, stuff like that, they could have birds around telling them an army is coming before they are supposed to be aware of it. How would you go about defeating a necromancer in that kind of situation? One that's held up in a fortress, like, let's say, in a mountainous area that normally armies would struggle to get through how would you end up if you were let's say the knight coming to defeat the necromancer what tactic would you use so the best tactic i feel for this it's you're gonna it's awkward because one you can use magic but it depends because if you've got a necromancer this strong then you are going to need someone just as strong either in either in necromancy or in different types of magic or whatever and Depending on the fantasy, these individuals will not be common. Like, you can go and get a dragon for help, but that's got its own problems. You can go and get a wizard or somebody else for help, but why would they go out of their way, potentially getting putting themselves in mortal danger to get rid of somebody that they just don't care about, that isn't doing anything to them? So one of the best things that you can appeal to, in my opinion, would be the person's humanity, in a sense that you appeal to them making a mistake and fucking up. So human human beings are flawed creatures. We are just flawed creatures, and we can use that, and we have used that repeatedly throughout history to our advantage in making sure that other people mess up and other people make mistakes. You call on other people's bluff. You you could light you could light an aircraft and say that you're an apprentice. You're sick and tired of being treated as some kind of troll to the uh, to the politicking of nobles, and you want to get revenge, so on and so forth. You could get close and then stab him, if that would work, because you don't know what kind of state of living or death he's in. Or you could have it where he makes a mistake and you take advantage of that to do him in. And it could be a mistake wherein you tell him that uh, there's troops from a rival nation that's going to come and take the castle to then uh, use it to fortify their position over the land and use it as a castle's belly to own the land. So he could prepare, so if he believes it, he could he could send his troops elsewhere in preparation for this, or he could send out scouts or whatnot. And while he's busy, you capitalize on that, sneak in, and kill him. So you're basically talking about an assassination. Yeah, it has it has to be like you, I'm I'm picturing like a big epic battle or a fight wherein you wherein one person or a group of adventurers or whatnot take on. A massive horde of undead and they come out on top the problem though is the realistics of it like a person can only fight for so long and a person can only fight with so much fuel that it, it, a person is as a machine can only fight with so much that they have and undead however will be animated fueled and do whatever their master wants them to do if you take out that element then like the the most logical way of going about it is taking out the necromancer himself and that's also the most difficult part. It usually is, because from something I see in most common fantasy depictions of necromancers, uh, necromancers and their relation with their undead is essentially a hive mind mentality, mm. where the necromancer is the main focus. If you kill the necromancer, their undead will drop down. Makes sense. Or they're ne undead in a worse scenario, their undead will become uncontrollable. And at that point, it becomes... A uh, worse problem. Yeah, it becomes a problem. What do you do if they have intelligent undead that are uh, like generals? Depends if they are animated by the necromancer. If they stay sane and stay intelligent and they're still animated when uh, 
the necromancer dies, then at that point it becomes the equivalent of uh, a kingdom and the king gets assassinated and his military generals or nobles underneath, they would, I imagine they would try and vie for power. And there may be a power struggle at that point, which could in itself end the uh, undead army as they squabble amongst each other. What, what also helps is if they have... Oh, go on. What about a lich? Because like you, you assassinate him, then he's in the phylactery again, and he can still control things and manifest again from that. See, I had a joke about that, wherein it's like, ah, oh, I'm a lich now, and I've got this phylactery, this thing that, that is the only thing keeping me from life and death, the thing that maintains my existence. I surely, something so important should be guarded or kept secret. What should I do with it? Hmm, I know, I'm going to drop kick it in the ocean. <laughs> Yeah, we came up with so many crazy ideas. I think when it comes to phylacteries, you know, I think when it comes to phylacteries that uh, they are more of the assassination target than the lich, because if you destroy a phylactery, that also kills the lich. So In I, some it does. It's in some, I suppose. It, mm. it depends highly on the setting, but in a lot of them, you kill the phylactery, the lich dies as well, so it becomes a two-for-one instead of killing the, the lich and then trying to find the phylactery afterwards, you should just go for the phylactery in the first place because that way you don't have to bother fighting the lich. And also it depends if it can be destroyed because it might be protected by a uh, certain kind of magical spell or whatever that makes it incredibly difficult to destroy. I think it comes down to the fact that uh, necromancers, by their very nature and in most media that they're depicted in, their main um, advantage compared to all other kinds of villains or heroes or whatever is they are the masters of wars of attrition. Because uh, raising undead, usually the undead aren't as strong or as nimble or as anything as a living person would be, except in certain circumstances. But what they are is a resource that does not need to eat or sleep or drink or anything and they can essentially wait out anything and uh as mentioned before essentially when it uh when a necromancer is starting off they're generally a bit weaker but when they start really ramping things up it becomes a snowball effect because it at their core essence a necromancer is just a person who can make dead things come back to life so theoretically a necromancer could just keep on raising the dead that keep dying so a battle takes place and their skeletons all die at that point you could just essentially consider it no loss at all because then you could just raise the skeletons that were destroyed unless their bodies are useless there's, there's more things to take into account with this as well, such as. Uh, to, oh, uh, typic I'll be quick. Uh, typically for the setting, uh, typically for the setting, like if it's medieval, the death rate will be high, which means that there's plentiful corpses. Not only that, but depending on on the kind of political situation, there can be past battlefields dotted around with some bodies that could have been forgotten that a necromancer can have, but a weakness that they also have from this is that they can be stretched too thin and they can have too many undead to effectively control in a bureaucratic sense how do you control that many undead with one person and know everything of every detail where every single one of them is i mean in overlord um the uh, the protagonist even says quite a few times i think that with all of the undead he's got made even he can't keep track of them all and even when he knows where they are, it kind of, it's like a sort of blur. Sort of. So. Well, that's where I think the strategy I would use to come in. I think guerrilla warfare is actually the best way to handle it. So what you do is, of course, the necromancer is the main target. So you make a small elite unit and have them go for there. But you still have to fight the armies of the undead or you're going to lose your land and your people and your villages. You can't just ignore the army. So if you use small units of guerrilla warfare, you can then spread out and confuse the necromancer himself when he's having to deal with it, as well as making them smaller units because you know you couldn't win a war of attrition because morale with people, they don't stop. So you have to use the smaller units. As well as that, I would make it so each unit 
has some kind of rune on them that if they die, their body is unusable. It's like disintegrated or something like that. Like blessed by a paladin. Or something. Yeah, wh- whatever you need to do to prevent raising. And doing this allows you to cut off the undead because they're not, most won't be unintelligent unless they have generals. And even then, you can just target the generals as your main target. Mm-hmm. I think- and slowly cut them off and basically make their numbers hurt them. See, there was there was a thing that I worked on, um, on kind of on the side for a bit, and I was, it was a, a, it was an interesting idea that I thought hadn't really been done a lot before, and it could it could be used quite uh, comically, but also effectively. And it was, it was for a story, and uh, what it was is it was the idea that holy magic, when it interacts with undead. Uh, it reacts so volatilely and so violently that it causes the undead to explode. So what it was is you had um, a necromancer who had gotten a, who had killed a inquisitor type person who could use holy magic or a type of it, and raised him and had access to this person's magical abilities. So he so the necromancer was experimenting with it, and what he did was he cut off parts, uh, he cut off like hands and. Uh, parts of the arms of whatnot of previous and dead that he has had the magic per- uh, had the religious person cast a holy spell on it and it would cause that body part to explode so he would use this as types of explosives but it would also but so because of the way that this works it would also mean that any parts that he would use would be he can't get back but also any undead this happens to he can't get back uh, i imagine that could be used quite effectively uh to defeat an actual necromancer themselves in that situation, because at that point, large hordes of undead would essentially become living biobombs. Especially if you send a bunch of fodder. Uh, I'd like to come back to the the guerrilla warfare just quickly. Um, oh, yeah. So elves would be really good for that, wouldn't they? For the for the warfare, you mean? Yeah, yeah, the guerrilla warfare. Yeah. Like if it's if it's in a wooded area, for example. What I wanted to I say think- is like. If you think of it like an RTS game, right? If you've mm. ever played StarCraft, it's really hard to keep track of everything that's going on. Like if you're yeah. watching a 300 actions per minute Korean and you're like an 80 actions per minute just standard guy, then you're getting really fucked over because you've got like drop ships coming in, dropping troops in like your main base and there's like a battle going over on over here, like a skirmish over there and you just get frazzled and overwhelmed and then you start it losing. Puts- I was going to say, it could be worse. Like, the enemy could just make a bunch of holograms and then you just rage quit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think that's a good idea to, like, just overwhelm the necromancer with too many sources and then he starts making mistakes because he would have to control mm. everything. And I think dividing his attention. Di- up like divert that. his control, like, split his attentions. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. And especially when it comes to guerrilla warfare you it's been shown in many real life examples that guerrilla warfare is one of the best ways to fight uh, an opposing force which you think you've got no way of winning obviously there's the very obvious example of vietnam with the americans the vietnamese the Viet Cong. they had some of the best oh, uh, yeah. guerrilla warfare tactics possible because the thing, they knew their environment. The thing with that, though, is that they're trained, like, with the holes that they're in, they're trained from a really young age with, with that, but they're also, like, they, they will be in those throughout those holes, like, in and out throughout their entire lives. Like, they will be so accustomed to it, it's unreal. Mm-hmm. But even before you get to that extreme amounts, their guerrilla warfare in general has a massive amount of um, utility when it comes to fighting large opposing forces, even if you're not going that extreme. Like, one of the best examples that I know of is actually um, during the Scottish Wars of Independence, uh, fought by William Wallace, there's mm-hmm. a particularly well known battle called the Battle of Stirling Bridge, which essentially had an English. Uh, lord wanting to take over sterling castle but in order to get to sterling castle he had to cross over a narrow bridge over a river and then go up a hill that would lead him to the castle and he had planned to do this he marched his army across this narrow bridge in order to get there but what he didn't realize was the wallace's forces were in a wooded area that was just over at the other side of the bridge remaining hidden so that once the english forces then came over the bridge and were sort of already halfway across it and essentially had focused their forces and going over the bridge side by side they then attacked by running down from the hill 
from their hidden position. At that point, they only had to fight a couple of people at the front of the bridge because they couldn't uh, all gather at the front because they were, the bridge was too narrow for them. And at that point, they realized because the Scots had the height advantage and were barrowing down on them because they were stuck halfway across the bridge, they couldn't uh, beat them in one-on-one -on -one combat. So a lot of them tried to retreat, but they couldn't retreat backwards because they were stuck on the bridge because it was too narrow because they had horses and such. So mm. a lot of them just jumped over the side of the bridge into the water but because, their, uh, because their armor was too heavy. A lot of them drowned. And so mm. the Scots won that battle by an absolute landslide. Um, another thing as well is defeat in detail. Now, Napoleon is really, really good at this. Now, when it comes when it comes to um, trying to defeat a necromancer, I feel like looking at uh, historical uh, people and what they've done, like like the one the example you gave. Um, Napoleon's really good for this. Like he's an absolute mad lad. Um, but there's also uh, what's his name? I want not. Alexander, Alexander the Great. There's Alexander the Great, and there's also Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan is of is of special interest because of the, uh, you know, the catapulting bodies that he was doing. Mm -hmm. But um, what there was one thing that Napoleon did, and Napoleon, being the absolute mad lad he is, came up with defeat in detail, wherein he would split his forces. So you'd have about say you're trying to get a position, trying to take over a position, or, you, or you've got an enemy with a superior force, and in one spot and they can overrun your spot but they they're not fully aware of that so say for example you've got 500 like uh, groups of 500 people in different positions acting as kind of like forwards um forwards outposts or forward positions just waiting for orders what you would do is you would take men from the rest so say that you take half from the rest put them into one and then you'll have that and when your opponent advances with a force you would defeat that force and then you would split them equally amongst everyone else. And then when they're coming again, you move everyone from the other ones again over to another one. But you keep men there to maintain the position. The thing with this, though, is it requires an incredible amount of communication, planning, and you need to be able to get everyone from these positions over to other positions at a really, really quickly. Not only that, but if a battle goes poorly, then the whole thing will fall apart. So you need to have really good commanding skills as well, and skills with, and skills with leading troops. And if you're and if you've got a necromancer who cares very little for his minions, who will happily send them into into you know like in to die, or you'll have a leader that, or you'll have a necromancer that is inexperienced. This can be used to your advantage massively. Because the, you could have it where this necromancer will lead their troops into an ambush or straight to death without realizing until after they're all dead. Nice. Because the undead can't complain, can they? They can't really say no. They can't say, oh, no, we're going to die. They can't say this is a stupid idea. A lot of it, unless unless that necromancer gets intelligent and dead, that even then won't necessarily help him and instead could give bad advice or undermine his or her efforts. Until that point, the necromancer is all by themselves. And for the time period, education is not really going to be a very big factor that necromancers can use to their advantage. It's essentially a dictatorship at that point. Yeah, yeah. It all falls on this one person. And if that one person fails in any given field that requires them to succeed, they're done for. And it's because of this that these that necromancers can be exploited in such a way because it's not a bureaucratic military organization with people doing the rations people doing the supplies people doing the armor crafting people doing this people doing that it's one person with a bunch of magic with a bunch of undead of different types with a lot of power and it's with and it's with that that it can all fall apart you take out that one human element or you or you abuse or exploit that one human element the whole thing crumbles but it's also because of this as to why necromancers can be incredibly strong as well because if you've got one that knows what they're doing and is experienced possibly having survived from previous battles that they failed in learned from that or could you could you could even have it where this necromancer is a noble that has been educated their entire life is uh, could be that they've been fucked out of say a certain political marriage or rulership or whatnot so then they go away learn necromancy for the sole purposes of coming back and taking over it it changes things because the background of the person has to be taken into account as well 
is it a rogue peasant that's angry that their family's dead, so they take up necromancy and do a bunch of stuff? You don't. Then you can just exploit them because they're a peasant with a bad education. But they could be self-educated as well, and you've got to take that into account. Is it a noble that? has access to all of this stuff before they did ne necromancy then it's different so basically you're talking about um outsmarting the necromancer pretty much yeah yeah i think that's a word. And there's a lot and there's a lot of ways you can go about this because when it because kingdoms will have one advantage that a necromancer won't have and you will see this with a lot of stuff as well and this is something that is really important that not a lot of people talk about is kingdoms have how do i word it they've got a military complex right there will be soldiers there will be generals to lead those soldiers there will be training there will be things in place to have an entire military structure it will be like a pyramid or it will be a it will have strength for an architecture and framework to it. It will be developed. Like if you've, I, if I'd you, I have to disagree on this one. I think oh, a on. well enough set necromancer will also have this pyramid structure with intelligent undead generals. Mm. The thing is with that though is that these generals will have to want to help and succeed. Not all of them do. Yeah, but assumedly, assumedly there there could be a necromancer that has generals that want to help or oh, being absolutely. enthralled by the necromancer makes you not be able to act against him so mm -hmm. they inherently have to and they can't not act in best interest it could even be it could even be a somewhat benevolent necromancer that makes deals instead of forcing intelligent undead to do work for him so it could be that if you do this for me i'll do this for you like because obviously you've not moved on into the afterlife like there's something that you're going to be staying for so you do this for me and i will help you settle your grievances and move on or it could be that the intelligent undead want to stay like existing because they mm. probably have some sort of self realization being intelligent so it inherently makes sense so i don't like the necromancer but if i lose here i die mm. yeah. um what I was going to say is that, what I was going to say is like with, say, bandits or with um, bandit groups or like, say, with orc hordes and whatnot, it's there, like, it, if, you've got, if you've got a horde or a bandit group or a rogue element in a country that's going from place to place, they don't have what normal militaries and nations have. Nations will be sending supplies to their troops. They will be sending weapons, armor. They will be outfitting and looking after their troops a lot like there's like there's a big investment to have a to have soldiers in whatever place because you will still have to look after them in the place that they're at so there's a lot of stuff to take them into account with this but with um say with an the so you got orcs during raid but if if an if if a necromancer or a bandit group or an orc group or whatever lose a big battle they don't have that same luxury they don't have um supplies going to them their supplies are strictly limited to what they can take and what they can raid. If they lose one battle, then they have to go to another place while uh, damaged, while with lesser numbers, and they will have to raid it or do another battle in order to take stuff that could do them in. They will have to constantly do this over and over and over, and it will only work so long as they keep as long as they keep winning. When when one big defeat could signal their entire loss because uh, the whole thing could fall apart and they could go against a defended albeit weak uh not uh, town that could potentially win against them because you know they've suffered heavy casualties and whatnot what about uh what about necromancer versus necromancer situations Ooh, i mean that is that... the ultimate counter isn't it just <laughs> yeah that that would be sort of i feel like if anything that quickly becomes an rts in real life mm -hmm. just constantly spawning minions <laughs> yeah i mean if it's a more powerful necromancer that necromancer basically sweeps and if it's weaker then he causes chaos in the ranks by taking over undead in there mm. yeah. there's also there's also something as well is you could have a big scrap between two necromancers throwing bodies at one another but what you could also have is you could have a spirit that is that is being given orders to go to the other necromancer um to appear very you know innocent or naive and whatnot is then enslaved and at the right moment could break through their slavery and follow the original necromancer's orders and kill the necromancer that's following you know following their orders essentially acting as a double agent yeah 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 or a spy or or something to 
kind of like if you've got a necromancer that is so that has so many undead that it's hard to keep track of what's one more undead that to the mix like say for example i mean say for example that you send in a zombie or a skeleton that to act as a spy how can a necromancer tell this one apart from the rest oh i mean I think it would entirely depend on the sin- the fantasy setting. It does, it, and and how the magic is used and all of that. Like it could work. I mean, although the, one of the best ways to do this could be with spirits or ghosts because they can go through walls and they can properly proper spy. It's basically an. I mean, if I was an undead who had a spirit just come to me and it was like, "I want to join you," I'd be like, "Okay," but I'd have you go to the front lines because I don't know who you are and don't trust you. I was saying, Chip. I was just saying, it's basically an assassination again. Mm. Just a different method. What about uh, conventional warfare tactics of using siege equipment and such? Because I imagine uh, against the undead, siege equipment would be pretty useful, considering that I don't imagine, unless they are also using siege equipment, of course, that a lot of undead wouldn't be able to utilize siege weapons such as trebuchets, catapults, things like that. Because then, at that point, you're thinning out the army as it makes its way towards you. I think it's great. Yeah. Mm. I think That's... the problem is, is because it's so immobile, you're going to get swarmed. Well, that's that's actually the thing. Like, um, my idea of how to, like, take over, uh, how to kill an egg commander is, you know, basically trapping his own lair. If he's just, like, having, like, his own fucking place, just, like, make sure there's seizure equipment nearby. Because that way, if they try to swarm by, we can take care of them. While the guerrilla warfare tactics slowly will down his numbers. And I'd also probably like hire a few dwarves or something to see if they can sense the earth in case the, the necromancer tries to dig his way out or like try to make another entrance. So eventually, like backing him into a corner. Yeah, just slowly, just slowing him down, just killing all of his units one by one. It, it might take a bit, but. It, there won't be really any bodies for him to get, and there won't be too much for him to be able to do. Divide and conquer tactics, Sun Tzu would be proud. <laughs> I think then it depends on the magic there, because like if the necromancer can know teleportation, he can just go, I'm out of here, boys. No, that's true. Like that. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> uh, but there's also certain... Uh, there, in that same sense, there's also spells that can cancel out magic in certain fields. Yeah, like... If, if, if someone cast a particularly powerful dispel magic on the necromancer, then at that point his entire army just crumbles in front of them. Like, well, it, no, it, it, it could be like the army, but it could also just be like he, uh, uh, somebody could just sense necromancer trying to use the interpretation and just said, how about no? Nah, true. I'm just, I'm just thinking now, because it, dispel... It depends on his power, though, because assumedly if you're fighting a war with a necromancer, he's pretty strong. And to find mm. a mage who can cancel out his magic easy isn't an easy task. Well, they could focus their efforts on it because say uh, they put their entire, let's say, mage's council's effort into finding particularly powerful fireball magic or whatever to take out swaths of armies, but then they end up just coming back. What if instead they just focused on casting an incredibly powerful one-use time dispel uh, magic on the necromancer himself so that... He then can't, he essentially gets silenced, can't use any of his magic, and then immediately his entire army crumbles in front of him. Because I mean, that's, kind of, that, that's kind of the tradition, isn't it? That the necromancer, as soon as his minion crumbles, he's kind of a sitting duck. Yeah. I I'm, just, I'm just that, imagining. Uh, go on. I think as a strategy, then, the necromancer, if he's smart, would have smaller forces be like attacking villages and such, making it so if they go and do that, that they're going to lose massive villagers and people like that. And if they do lose control, then there's going to be wild undead attacking villages still, because they're still out there making it a kind of a loose scenario. If they try and do a strat like that and by just pushing on them. I was going to say like, there's, there's, a, there's a few things that you could do with this as well is you could have, depending on the kind of magic, um, the spell typically isn't a, really tough thing to use you could have people you could have people there voice break you could have people there like sort of tapping on dead going tap 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 this spell this spell, spell gone 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 you could also have it wherein um the relationship between the necromancer and the undead is messed with you could have a ritual done by powerful mages and wizards and whatnot wherein they will cast a spell to affect that connection 
So instead of doing what the Necromancer wants to do, the Undead will do the exact opposite to have a bit of chaos. But it could also have it wherein uh, it could mess with the connection that the Necromancer has with the Undead, wherein the Undead will cos- could possibly see the Necromancer as food or as an enemy or whatnot. Or it could have it wherein he can't control them, so they just do random things. It could be that they're just meandering around. Some of them are really aggressive. Some of them are just sort of inert and inactive. Um, do you guys want to talk about traps? Because I think that's a really good tactic. Um, yeah, I sure. Check out one or two other things. Um, I'm, I'm just like looking around. Um, I'm checking out uh, from like the D and D five E thing. Uh, just for, like one of the uh, sources. Um, it says that when it comes to the spell magic, it only like works for magical effects. If you try to actually uh, target it on an undead, it'll do nothing. Because they're just kind of animated in their own sense. It's not. It's weird, but there's certain clever uh, rules and that kind of stuff. And it's also if there's like, you also understand that like um in those kinds of worlds, wizards also have to kind of like dedicate themselves to be able to do whatever the, their certain task is because it takes all this kind of fucking lore and knowledge, which is why you know, why, why like all the um like elder wizards are so fucking dope because they have like all this knowledge and shit. But like a necromancer, because we probably spend all this time just focusing on dead. It would probably be too hard for him to even like really use like a teleportation spell or anything like that, unless he's specifically trained to do that. Uh, do that as well, since there's like you know such a weird fucking variety in like just investigation in this new field that is necromancy. Since you know no one's really keeping a book on necromancer types or how to raise them and shit. The second thing is also like um it makes me wonder what would happen if the, the undead used my idea from like uh, uh from before, which is to make your lair underneath or a part of uh, a monument like a place where they can't really risk destroying the whole area because it's like it's like essential or like underneath the city or some shit yeah it, it's, it's not it's not really too much like a trap it technically is no, no, a trap, no, 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 trap no, no. Own, i was gonna i was gonna fine. start talking about traps but if you're uh wanting to say more uh, i'm sorry can... i don't know i'm not that's that's more or less it this makes me wonder how the hell they deal with someone who just built a place in mind or just a place they can't destroy in general. So point. for traps, I think the problem is, is they only really work once because you have to set them up beforehand. But if you have a lot of undead, they're going to trigger the majority of the traps. And if they just send a small force to do it first, they can clear out all the traps with small losses and then continue to go through. That's true. It could be combined with uh, siege equipment and such. So, like, you could start with having a layer of, let's say, pitfall traps, which a bunch of undead fall into, and then a commander realizes, oh, wait, there's pitfall traps. And so it commands them to start going around them. And while this is happening, they have uh, trebuchets and they have giant catapults in the back that are peppering the undead as they're moving around them. And then once they reach the uh, the main fighting force, there's far less undead, and the necromancer can't focus on commanding them because it's got to focus on raising their own undead. Well, this ignores the fact that most likely they'll have elite units. So what do you do when they have their undead dragon come over and just fly by and melt down all your like uh, trebuchets and stuff like that? Well, that In, if they're mainly using mindless, I think that can work as a strategy. But if you counter in like having elite and strong and dead, then you get into more problems with it. It's more like a secondary defense than an actual tactic, I think. I was gonna. I was, I've got a few things to say now. One, all I could think of throughout that, throughout that entire bit was traps aren't gay. Just. <laughs> <laughs> so all I could think of is like when somebody said traps, all I, I could just think, all I could think of was just that. I think to myself, they're only two point fourteen percent gay, which isn't really good. Anyway, um, <laughs> for something as uh, something that I feel like uh, you mentioning the dragon is kind of sort of reminded me of this, but something that we're not taking into account is that in a fantasy world, there's going to be typically more than just human races. There's going to be lizards. There's going to be like orcs, elves. There's going to be this. There's going to be that. There's going to be like cat people for some reason uh, there's going to be like fairies there's going to be like beast men there's going to be this that and tother um and necromancer has a lot when it could like when it comes to diversity of undead and necromancer has a lot and depending on the type of um 
skeleton or depending on the type of undead or like ratios and whatnot it can all be taken into account like say for example you've got a troll does that regeneration effect that a troll typically has in fantasy is that still applied after death mostly not but if it does how could that be used very effective because because I mean, like, take Warhammer for example. Um, there's a there's a really fat, overweight goblin, a really really fat, a real fat fucker, a real fat goblin called Grom the Punch, who's got who's eating some troll meat, and it's try it's regenerating inside his stomach. Somehow, it's still able to regenerate. Sounds awful. <laughs> Being so exactly. Yeah. So with that. If a necromancer was to get a troll and rip off parts of it, is it like a starfish wherein it can regenerate itself back into a hole again? Can the kind of necromancer just sort of have this to 3D print undead? In this too, like an example in Pathfinder is the bloody skeleton. It's after you kill it. If it isn't like blessed or like dunged in holy water, an hour later it'll just like reform. That'd be a real pisser. You think you've won your battle, everyone's celebrating, drinking mead, and then the whole battlefield just gets up again. And it's great, well, too, because the bloody skeleton is literally, like, always drenched in blood and dripping, so you just have, like, a sea of blood raise up again. Jeez, oh. Oh, if you could directly control blood, that'd be fucky. That would be very... That sounds very much like a vampire type of thing. I mean, mm. yeah, that's, that, that, that sounds like blood magic, but if well, a necromancer know... was a bit of that, he could fuck with it. The thing that always gets me about blood magic is, like, when it comes to it, how do you stop blood from coagulating? Because magic. No, but it's it's, it's like it's like it's like ah, oh, it's, it's, it's literally magic. I feel like they just say it uh, because fucking, yeah, fucking because magic. It, it, a wizard did it. <laughs> I mean, the magic just keeps it at heat. Easy clap. It's just I'm just picturing like all this blood sort of like coming out of a person because there's you got a blood mage doing it, and somehow this blood is just constantly liquid and it's like it it's constantly liquid. It looks thick, but it's flowing like water, and it just doesn't coagulate at all. It just doesn't harden or anything. Like there's no sticky bits or there's no sort of horrible kind of like you, you know you know when you have a wound and it he and it's as it's healing you've got like bits that you can just like pick out or there's like really solid sticky bits of it yep. or or whatnot. Or, or like, or like, you know, when you pick your nose and you and you go back to the bar, so you have a nosebleed, and then and then you can, and then and then after it's gone, and then you you're still rummaging around in there, and then you get like these really red bits that are really sticky on your fingers. You've just revealed so, a lot so, of information about yourself, then, there, friend. Then, well then. And, and, and then you've got like the blood residue on your fingers, so then you have to like wash your hands, and it's really annoying. Like like that, it's. Yeah, but... None of that is taken into account because magic. But uh, yeah, I was about to say it's like because of magic and also hardening ability, the neck, uh, the, the blood mage, whatever the fuck it's called, you can also just take that advantage. Just like keeps it free form until it just wants to make a spear out of blood. Speaking of mages, actually, I think that using particular kinds of magic would be one of the best ways to defeat undead. For example, using say, uh let's call it let's 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 just call the spell sea of fire where instead of just showing off a fireball it just literally drenches an entire battlefield in a giant wall of flame now normally in conventional warfare it'd be effective but it would also kill a lot of your own men but if you're fighting against the skeleton horde at that point well the 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 collateral damage doesn't really matter because they're all clumped together anyway if they're mindless undead anyway see yeah, there's a thing think- yeah. I think that's a great strategy as long as there isn't like mage undead that can use like protective magic. Mm. But it's like a- in an undead horde, a sea of fire would totally wipe out like any mindless. Uh, there's a thing that you can do with this, where in, in and you can do this in total Warhammer 2 um, and 1. You've got spells that follow a linear path. All right, like they just go in a straight line. So what you can do is you can send all your troops to go against the enemy, and there will be like a wall of your guys and their guys fight scrapping against one another. Yeah, where they'll both there's like a, a section where they both meet, and there will be a, and there will be a section where they're all bundled up on the other end in a thick wall, ready to replace those that fall. You could have a spell going in a linear path alongside this, careful to avoid your own troops, which is completely decimating theirs. You could even use, uh, in some fantasy settings, uh, 
you could use dedicated damaging holy magic because obviously the the thing with damaging holy magic is it works on undead but it doesn't work on the living so at that point then it's literally you can do as much collateral damage as you want because your guys aren't going to be hit by any kind of say sunfire spells or something because that's only going to hurt the undead yeah, and it might even heal the troops the, the living exactly ones. yeah What else is there? Because there's, there's a lot. But, uh, when it comes to undead as well, and defeating an air command, so are we talking about uh, what, what do we do for special undead? What do we do for special undead? What do we do for intelligent undead? What do we do for ones that you don't typically see? Well, in those kind of circumstances, if they're intelligent enough to communicate, you could even work upon uh, negotiating with them or yeah. trying to convince them to work against the necromancer. Because I'm going to imagine that a lot of intelligent undead probably aren't the biggest fans of working under a necromancer. Mm. Like, let's say a vampire. A vampire, on most occasions, wants to be its own type of thing, wants to be its own powerful creature. But if it has to subjugate itself underneath a powerful necromancer, but in but it gets an offer from their enemy that oh, if you kill the necromancer, then we'll leave you be. At that point, then it can think to yourself, oh, well, if the Necromancer dies, then I can instead take his place and become the most powerful undead creature possible. So at that point, then it becomes you convince essentially the army to devour itself from the inside. What I was going to say is... Uh, go on. I was going to say real quick, I think the biggest problem with that is in most media with like necromancers, when they have intelligent undead, they're still enslaved, so they can't act against their master. So trying to convince them otherwise wouldn't mm. work. It's kind of like if the vampire wanted to kill his master already, he doesn't need to be convinced by someone to try it. That's true. It might work against like a vampire society, though. Like if mm. like working bureaucracy itself to death, essentially. Yeah, I think oh, well, imagine yeah. imagine what happens to a country when the bureaucracy just says, you know what, we've had enough and goes on, goes on strike. Oh, oh. Christ, the, the country would be brought to a standstill. Like it reminds me, it reminds me of the whole thing with like um, if you have like workers striking, like lower class workers striking, and they bring uh, some kind of industry to a standstill. They they have a lot of power to get what they want, but if you've got bankers, for example, going on strike. Like it, it happened. Like you, I think you've got one that happened in uh, Ireland. I think it was where bankers went on strike for a bit. It was either Ireland or Wales. Show, show, shows 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 uh, shows my uh, information. Um, shows shows my knowledge of of yeah of the UK. Um, and bankers went on strike for a long while, and in the end, they had to give in because nobody was meeting their demands because there wasn't a lot of leverage that they had with that. Like they just got other bankers in to fill the roles, and the, and if they didn't, then they just—I mean—the bankers just go to a different bank. Not sure what's got ATMs. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking that it could—it could always be—it could always be that could a necromancer enter a civil sort of um, appropriate professional kind of relationship with a vampire, as in a necromancer will promise, like say for example, that you've got a vampire that's weak. And the two of them enter into a kind of partnership together, wherein it's like a symbiotic relationship where they will both benefit. The necromancer gets bodies given to them from the vampire, and in return, the vampire can uh, get power or more, or can get certain people or whatnot from the necromancer. So it could be that the necromancer will take captives to give to the vampire, and the vampire will return these as bodies once the vampire is fed. Or it could be that the uh, the vampire will provide bodies and in return the necromancer researches how to improve the vampire's state of affairs so say for example like you know how you've got different types of vampires like you'll have really weak ones you'll have feral ones you'll have uh, lower class ones you'll have like upper class like pure blood ones and whatnot um you could be that a vampire wants to reach a higher state of undeath that the necromancer can provide I'm pretty sure that's what happened in Warhammer Fantasy with uh, Nagash and the Von Karsteins, that they oh. basically uh, decided to, well, when Nagash, that they essentially decided to join forces for the sake of we're both fighting a common enemy, let's fight the common enemy together, and it will both benefit us. But then, of course, as Nagash tends to do, 
Nagash tended to betray people, so funnily enough, he betrayed the vampires. <sighs> well, why why does Nagash like was it was he hurt when he was young? Was he betrayed when he was younger? Has that scarred him for life? Why does he keep doing that? Oh, because edge. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, I was about to like, say, why doesn't the Gesh any hack do with us? Uh, isn't he like the original Edge Lord in yes. the fucking Warhammer universe? I know he's one of them. Oh yeah, <laughs> the original Edge Lord. I, I, I would be I would not be surprised if we found a deep dark diary like the Codex Astartes. They just come over. They feel like, oh shit, we found the Gesh's diary. We'll find all of his. We're gonna know all the secrets. You know his plans. And just like it's just fucking Lincoln Parks just scribbled down. Betty left me today. I didn't like her anyway. <laughs> Girl, Carmelo, Carmelo, fucking let <laughs> one. This heart had the better friend that. she'll ever be. I'm just picturing that. It's like you got like cold play lyrics just written down. Just like, oh, f imagine in the diaries where it just goes on like, mother did not provide me with tendies today. Mother did, mother, mother did not do this for me today. My angst, my pain, my suffering. Nobody knows what I'm going through. <laughs> what if um, I dropped a penny on my foot? The immense pain I felt suffers like a thousand burnings and nails being put into my feet. My souls were quivering and my soul ached. I had never known that there was this kind of pain before in my life, but I shall now inflict upon others. That sounds well. That was way too well done. Have you got experience in this? <laughs> um, so, coming back to fighting against undead, uh, Something that I have always wondered about is one of the big problems when it comes to fantasy warfare, especially when it comes to necromancy warfare, is ne undead versus constructs or golems. Because uh, yeah. essentially, a golems and and especially like let's say dwarven machinery are essentially superior in every single way. Mm. Um, but, Arguably, but demons are, but demons you have the risk of you know, losing your soul and all of that. I think uh, against demons, I think the problem with demons is that because you're not the, the, the master of essentially, you're just essentially hiring them on assistance. Uh, they can't really be trusted. Yeah. Uh, but for golems, uh, they can't be reanimated because they're usually made of synthetic materials. Mm. Uh, they're generally much stronger than any other undead that you'll fight against, and a lot of them are tied to specific elements. So, like, well, let's take uh, the Elder Scrolls, for example. Fire Atronachs are literal embodiments of flame. They could just walk into a battlefield and fight undead, and at that point, all the undead are on fire and spreading fire to each other. Isn't that a demon? Atronox or he? Uh, yeah, Atronox. I, I don't know. They're, they're summons. Atronox yeah, sure. are demons because they come from a uh, what's? The yeah, name? they come. F they come from a plane of a blue. It's Atronox are like Dram uh, are Dramora, I think. Yeah, Dramora. It's um, I think with Atr it's like with Atronox and with like conjured stuff. It's like uh, you're taking a Dramora from this place and you're shaping it. So I think it's a case like like you know how you can conjure swords and whatnot. It's yeah. well, yeah. What you can what you can do is you can uh, like the swords that you conjure. I think if I'm remembering the law correctly, I'm probably going to get somebody spamming the comments uh, after after saying this because I don't know the law correctly. But I think for the law, it's the case where the uh, like dr the souls of Dramora are basically shaped into weapons and whatnot. So it's like this weapon that you're holding could very well be intelligent and really annoyed that you're just using it to stab someone. <laughs> yeah, but um. Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say. So for golems, the biggest problem with golems is they're expensive to make. Mm. So you can't make as many as an undead can be made because you need the resources, the mages to make it, and the time it takes to make one. While the necromancer has the advantage of bodies are easy to get, easy to raise, easy to dish out. See with my with my uh, with my world when it comes to golems, they are incredibly effective against undead. But interestingly, like it's not them being made that's the problem. The problem is public opinion of them. It's because of what they were inspired by and what people associate them with that people don't like them. So, oh. so event like eventually they do get used against undead and they do perform very very well alongside other stuff as well. Um, but it's it's. The reasons, yeah. How how do you think golems would fare against giant undead constructs? 
was about to say. Uh, I- it depends. It depends on what the golem is being used for. Because like I've like I've been thinking a lot recently of golems uh, having uh, being designed for special purposes. Like you can't have big lumbering um, idiots just sort of like smashing big stone fists against you know undead and constructs and whatnot. But what you could do is you could literally build golems to be walking siege weapons. You could have ballistas or trebuchets or catapults built into them as part of their design. Mm. I, had, I, mean, uh, I mean, if you if you have it more modern, you could have like anti-air guns built into them as well. <laughs> as part of uh, one of my fictions, I actually there was a, a a fun sort of thing surrounding the concept of fighting giant undead, where a necromancer is fighting against a large horde, and then I think it was against a dwarven uh, army, and the dwarves bring out this giant brass golem that's got you know all the powered by steam incredibly powerful unstoppable mm, mm. so the so the necromancer decide hmm i'm not going to be able to beat this because i've got thousands upon thousands of tiny skeletons fighting against this was essentially what to this giant golem is toothpicks so instead uh he decided to essentially suit up by immediately disassembling his entire army and then building around himself a giant sort of power armored suit of bone what and, the then f- beca- and then became a giant sort of bone golem that he controlled directly and then fought against the brass golem himself and it was quite effective have you got you know i nobody ever talks about iron man's edgy teenage any edgy teenage years do they <laughs> Have you guys ever seen no. like an elephant versus a car or something? Like the car gets completely obliterated. That so, would like, be terrifying if it was undead. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. So like, I'm pretty sure, especially if the golem is hollow, a big fleshy monstrosity could actually crush a golem quite easily. You got me thinking of undead cars now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, also, I feel like one of the other things about golems is I feel like you have to control them a lot more directly because even undead, mindless as they are, they used to have a brain. They have like rather simple cognizance. Once you raise them, they pretty much know how to stand up by themselves. Golems, you kind of have to program everything into them, and you basically like uh, you have to like have a lot of direct control over them because they're they're literally lumps of stone. You're commanding to go walk around. There's a chance a motherfucker can just trip up and not know how to get up. Oh god, I've got a terrible joke now. Is it like a stone version of Humpty Dumpty? No, it's <clears throat> Toyota's brand new car, the Deadus. We guarantee that every single Deadus is fueled is fueled by the indentured souls of of employees that we work to death. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds about right. Yeah. Um with okay, so with golems and with like constructs and whatnot, I feel like because because of how comp like how warfare is in the sense that it's warfare in a lot of ways is kind of like I counter I counter this or I counter I counter your counter well I counter your counter this counter my counter it goes on like that a bit like you'll have like you'll have uh, oh you've got cavalry we'll just have spears oh you've got armor armor piercing oh you've oh you've 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 got archers well uh I've got guns. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, oh, you've got guns. Oh. Um, uh, <laughs> more, 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 guns, more guns, more guns. When it comes to counter uh, methodology, necromancers, I feel, are more along the lines of horde mentality, where mm. even if anyone has counters to them, if they throw enough bodies at it, then uh, they will eventually win, regardless. <laughs> And that's just how they are. They don't rely upon specific counter. Well, maybe it depends on the necromancer, of course. Mm. But a lot of them, because they have such large armies, they instead just think, well, if I throw enough skeletons at them, they'll eventually lose. I suppose it's like uh, in uh, Warhammer 2, um, one of the advantages of playing as the vampire counts is your ability to have... Uh, an ability that reduces the upkeep on skeletal warriors yes, yeah. to zero. And at that yeah. point, uh, if you then just recruit a whole bunch of lords and heroes and just fill up their entire armies with skeletons, mm. no matter what, 
um, because you have basically no upkeep, you can essentially just throw entire armies of fodder at the enemy, and mm-hmm. you eventually you'll win because they just can't. They don't have time to heal themselves. Yep. They don't have time to fight back. They just essentially kept getting pestered until eventually they lost. This, there's a YouTuber. I mean, there's a YouTuber called Legend Total War that he talks about that, and I think I think it's like one of the top ten uh, videos that he did. Wherein, like, you, you just need to, you just need to have, like, if you've just got armies and armies and armies of undead, and you, you can just keep throwing and throwing and throwing, you will win no matter what, just through attrition alone. Just, just keep launching them and just throwing them, and then job done. I think that's the scary part about necromancers. Though, is they're not forced only into that large thing. They could make a small lead a unit as well, and they could have the both of best of those both worlds. They could even have an elite squad of, like, say performing assassination missions or something by having, uh, I don't know, let's say that there was a legendary thief that was dead and now he's taken his soul and he's now planted that soul within uh, a, a particular undead construct. And now that that particularly powerful and cunning thief can then lead an elite squadron into a castle or something while um, the actual fighting force is fighting outside. And then at that point, it becomes... Oh, well, the opposite of what we suggested, where we suggested guerrilla warfare takes out a necromancer, and in this case, the necromancer is sending a guerrilla warfare squadron to essentially take out, well, the head of the army that they're facing against. Um, two things. One, it's to give, to give an example of this, like, it's not a full example, but in Skyrim, you can get the, in the Dark Brotherhood, you can get the ghost of a long-dead assassin who will talk to you and can provide help and like you can summon him and he will uh, fight for you and whatnot and the other thing i'm trying to remember what the other thing was now oh my mind's just gone fuck's sake lucian the chance although shaman was quite useless in the game but still was nice to see him again mm-hmm. yeah it was nice to having just summon a ghost and just hear him actually talk instead of you know just nothing eventually dispel it because his talking becomes repetitive <laughs> <laughs> uh. Hey guys, can I mm-hmm. ask a question about um, environmental warfare? Because I'm quite curious about yeah, sure. this one. So like- okay, so with environmental warfare, so to take okay, so you've got to take into account that the environment will um, affect the living more than the dead, of course. Now, undead are much better. Now, I, I say that, and I know what you're going to say when it comes to temperature, but hold on. Undead are much better in colder climates than they are in warmer or hotter climates. Now, something that people don't take into account is the spread of diseases through flies. In hotter places, undead will be absolute hot spots riddled with flies, maggots, all kinds of stuff. These these flies can carry diseases that can that can affect the living. If you've got uh, somebody, or if the necromancer can somehow control or have something to do with the flies, you could actually have swarms of them infecting people with uh, pestilent diseases through this. So in hotter areas, necromancers have a problem with uh, the rotting of their undead being faster, but they can still get skeletons. And I think that in most settings anyway, that... Undead don't rot past their initial like zombie stages because of the magic. And while you yeah. definitely have variants like plague zombies where it's like intentional, I don't think anything like insects and stuff like that would actually start rotting the zombies. Probably because of like that negative energy killing the bugs trying to eat them. Mm, true. Yeah, that's that's one of the things I usually th- have to think about. Like this, certain things it usually depends on the setting. But once an undead is created, no matter what his environment is, his he usually doesn't change physically. Unless he has like such uh, stuff from battle or some shit. Beyond that, the dead just stays as when he was first revived. But you can probably still find ways to fuck with it. Do you think like animals in general can help at all? No, no animals <gasps> won't. Vultures, you, vultures. You can, no, 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 because they can kill them and then just raise the vultures. Fuck. I you mean, give them more animals. Get, uh, animals. Why would you? Get, why would you? You why do get vultures. You do no. You do get them in Tomb Kings. Like, they have, like, undead vultures. They oh. are, like, useless. <laughs> Dude. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Until like, you like, remember like, that if you make it a disease-carrying vulture, like, make it a plague vulture and have it just scratch and give diseases to everyone. How about, uh, how about a mix? Okay, uh, how okay. About, so, uh, how about it gives it, it gives diseases, but it also fucking explodes upon death that spreads yeah, why not? farther. But so, this, about, this... Yeah. What about, like, 
not directly in battle using these things, but if there's lots of vultures in like the general area, then it keeps the amount of corpses down that a necromancer can use, right? Wouldn't that be helpful? I know, because they can make them skeletons then. Yeah, I guess. I mean, it provides. I mean, they could. They're good for providing vision, and it's hard. To, like when a vulture's in the sky, it's hard to tell a normal one from an undead one. So, so um, yeah, I think against an undead vulture, <clears throat> like animals, is a bad play. Now, what I was going to say is, like, if you've seen that one scene from Narnia where all the birds like carry those rocks, you could get flying undead to do that. Like, they could, uh, as a scare tactic or a morale breaking tactic, they could drop uh, the decapitated heads of um, people onto the enemy. Eventually, uh, bombs. Or they could drop bombs. Well, what they could also do is you could you could like, I mean, I, I mentioned vultures from Warhammer, but the flying one, the flying on dead aren't really like unless they're the big ones, they're not really that good. Bats and vultures are just really terrible, and they are just so terrible. The dogs are okay, but oh god, the bats and the vultures. <laughs> I found so, the best way is anti siege equipment. Just send the bats at those. That works well. Mm, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That does work well. I think against the undead animals could be useful for one thing, which is pre-battle um, harassment. Not exact because obviously it's very difficult for animals to be controlled enough to fight. Because well, depending on the fantasy, unless you've got like wood elves or such. Um, but the advantage animals usually have is that they are not considered the main fighting force. And thus, if we combine that with guerrilla tactics, say, well, let's, let's, be, let's be literal. Let's take that you are a, a particularly powerful wood elf druid and you have the ability to control a large group of actual gorillas. <laughs> and you take those gorillas. They are not your main fighting force. They are just a force of really powerful but... Uh, small uh, grouped uh, creatures. And can, I, can I just quickly interrupt? You just gave something? them the gorillas, though. The uh, <laughs> necromancer now has a bunch of gorillas like, or like, a bunch I... of dogs. Because yeah, all I'm like... saying is, like, if you if you throw animals at him, he's just gonna raise them right then and there. It's and they're like, gonna oh, be scarier. You've, you've given him a unit of fucking dogs that can ram your ass. So you you've got gorillas, right? You got a necromancer fighting against uh, a druid or whatever with gorillas. I just all it's you can have the necromancer just the sort of sign going. I just hate guerrilla warfare. <laughs> no, I won't give you that one unless you actually have a good context of guerrilla warfare being used with little gorillas. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, okay, v okay. Oh. So Vietnam, Vietnam with gorillas. Maybe I might give you that because that could sound. This sounds very fucky. <laughs> like imagining just a gorilla. Dude grabbing a dude and pulling him into the hole jesus not even that imagine it's like, the undead I, I you're, being, you're being returned to monk against your will oh <laughs> dude I, I just imagine just like this dude like walking nearby you like go to about to take a piss but it's like instead of being grabbed by the bush he just gets uh, pulled from the trees and gets pulled up <laughs> you just hear his faint scream as he just gets pulled fucking higher and higher that's like something batman would do <laughs> yeah <laughs> Oh this god! I'm just, I'm just picturing. Just, just imagine like a, a gorilla, just like picking up an undead and just smashing over undead with it. Ooga booga! You're now my club, oh, bro. It, it's literally just a gorilla. Dude, imagine the undead gorilla edition. doing that to the people, though. Oh Christ! Yep. An, undead, an undead gorilla would be terrifying. And it doesn't yeah. have like the limits on strength like a normal living creature would, so it can go hog wild. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. It's literally just a gorilla warfare gorilla edition with Batman uh of fucking tactics. Okay, so for this, we're because of like where gorillas are found, we're assuming that this is going to be like some kind of jungle, sort of hot Africa like place, then, right? Probably. Okay, so we've got a necromancer in a place like that with vultures and whatnot. Um, I feel like the only animals that would be really good against them would be hyenas, because hyenas have at least some ability to have rotten flesh. But, yeah, but they're just going to be turned into undeads again. Like, yeah. the, the undead monkey a... army of the necromancer in the jungle <laughs> is going to uh, pull them have... up. Unless you have uh, a race I... of hyena people that is immune to undeath. That, that doesn't that sound I like mean, a that, thing. That's just a hard counter race, though. That's like <laughs> the assuming there. Yeah, it's like if hyenas, they're immune to undeath. That sounds very like... fucky. Having a, both the penis, penis and vagina, I can believe that, but... <laughs> <laughs> 
I think that one of the main ways that you have to realize when you're fighting, a, let's say, a typical undead army is slow, it's large, and it's stumbling towards you. I guess the best way is just using really quick fighting forces that are able to essentially attack and then quickly retreat and then attack again and then quickly retreat again again like guerrilla warfare so like, tactics yeah, yeah guerrilla tactics. so like let's even like, say cavalry cavalry that appears from the side hits the main fighting force runs off the main fighting force then diverts itself to deal with the cavalry and then at that point then the forces are diverted and you're able to properly fight again now, why not also, do... the problem with that is it assumes mindless undead slow hordes again it, it, it's, it's also it's also what not just that they again have like elite undead or fast undead. It's not also not just that. It's also that uh, if you're not going to the thinking that the neck matcher is so fucking dumb, he'd do that. If you have like a bunch of undead out in the open, I feel like that'd be a bad choice. Since I also feel like un uh, neck matchers would also probably have their own form of guerrilla warfare, since they also have like their own specialization. Like you can do so many surprise tactics with undead. It's so fucking weird. Like so, undead horses as well. Undead horses, ghosts, just assassinating people um, in, well, in, like, in their fucking houses. Like, there's literally nothing you can do against that kind of shit. It's just like. Undead ghost gorillas, when? <laughs> now! And then, of course, there's just, you know, the main tactic of dealing with a necromancer. The, quite honestly, if anyone is. If, if, if the undead hordes have taken over the world and the only thing left is fighting against the Dark Lord Nagar Fatok. And the only, the only thing you've got left to do at that point is give up. Because, yep. let's be honest, the only way to properly win against a necromancer is to stop them from being a necromancer in the first place by not having them raise the dead. Because again, it all comes back to they snowball from small beginnings and eventually they become so large that it becomes nigh impossible. Unless you're the chosen one, of course. And then Okay, course, in that case... In that case, we need to put in leftist policy to make sure that AG teenagers don't become necromancers. Oh, <laughs> no, that'll make them want to become necromancers more, you fool! <laughs> also, one other thing, that's also assuming if the necromancer has an unlimited pool of mana or, like, does not have a direct connection that's needed to actually control his undead. Oh god, I've just realized something. What? In a, in a modern day society with magic, school shooters would be necromancers. They would. Oh. So Oh, okay. Probably. But I, yeah, I think I, they'd be I think they'd be demon summoners, I'll be honest. Actually, yeah. Actually, yeah, 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 right, yeah, right. yeah, fair enough. A bull lead letter just fucking cutting himself and says, and I summon Nazul, killer of a thousand sons. Like, what the fuck? Necromancers are far more in tuned and intelligent for those kind of thinkings instead of the, the type of dude. Class oh, no, like, please, please, oh, yeah, the demon oh, god. Oh god, I'm just thinking of necromancers being incels now. No, 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 no. No, no. wait a minute, wait a minute. Of course no, they would be. <laughs> Depressing goths versus hardcore edge lords. That's basically what oh. the fight just boils yeah. down to. No, I'm just imagining it like, oh, uh, every every girl doesn't like me, and it's not my fault. So I'm I'm just gonna I'm just gonna make my own girlfriend from from oh. my graveyard. No. <laughs> no. Oh. I was also about to say something oh. else. Fuck, was it? Oh yeah, there's also might just be a unit limit to the uh, troops themselves, but again, that still does uh, rely on the setting. Gonna, I mean, what would the, what would the limit even be? It. Huh? Hmm? What would the limit even be? Uh, it, it's probably just something you have to train up yourself, because I feel like, or at least in my head, the representation is like, the undead basically have to take a image of, or like an idea from you, where they basically have to figure out how to like remember how to walk and uh, not really walk, but I mean, not talk, but just like walk around, do basic actions. They need to remember how to do that shit again. They basically just like uh, have a direct, a di more or less a direct link to your mind that lets them like remember how to do that shit. It's like, oh yeah, I know how to walk again. Doesn't let them like I mean, like, like uh, telepath uh, telepathically just tell them that shit, but like it, it just lets them figure out how to do it all over again. Since you know, like they're fucking mindless. How they even stand? That's a fucking complicated thing for just animals to do in the beginning. So I I feel like that could just be a thing that that would act as limitation, and you could just like slowly build it up by like you know reading tomes or just figuring out or just fucking around with just necromancy, you're just making your uh, your brain stronger in general. You could, you could have items that take the stress for you. 
As in, yeah. like, as in, it could be that a necromancer starts with like up to uh, 10, 20, and that number increases if they use items to remove that strain from themselves, and these items will handle the strain for them. Yeah, like, it, also... it, 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 oh, sorry. You could also just make undead necromancers that take the burden from you. Uh, yeah, but also, like, don't forget, like, it, like at the end of the day, necromancy is also like a specialization, but at the same time, they're also like basically like, another form of a wizard. They can uh, they can do all kinds of shit. And elder necromancers who decided to go uh, fuck around for a long ass time, they can definitely be insanely strong. But the same thing can be said for archmages who've also been around for a long time, who are also insanely strong. It's just a matter of, of how you use your materials and what are your like your resources open to you, aka what the spells do you have. Very true. When it comes to actually using artifacts for necromancy, there's a good example um, in a game called Wargroove, which is a, uh, a retro um, tactical game in the same sort of thing as Fire Emblem or Advance Wars. As part of that, um, there's a necromancer faction, which are based in like a cold mountainous area, but they're not necromancer for the fact that... Uh, they chose to do necromancy and stuff. They're actually a necromancy faction because the area that they're based in, the cold mountainous area, has naturally occurring undead and that they terrorize the nearby areas. But there is a, a gauntlet, an artifact. I can't remember its name. But the Infinity Gauntlet. Yes. That al- <laughs> and there's a gauntlet oh. that allows the person, whoever wears the gauntlet, to control the undead and thus keep the land safe. And so the people in that region look to whoever holds that gauntlet as essentially a, a pseudo leader. And because of that, he, the person who currently wields it is not a necromancer by choice, but is a necromancer because they are the ones that can control the undead. And without them, the undead would just go crazy and attack everyone. Con, I was going to say, this feels like it's very prone to people abusing that... I feel like there's going to have like a chosen one system, though. It's like, oh, you're not an asshole. Come here. Yeah. Because I also don't think like magic items are also magic. They can probably just sense your shit or intentions. If there's like a holy sword that fuels itself like it's about to be used to uh, kill just us and like a shit ton of fucking cities, the sword just might break itself. Chris, imagine... Imagine if you actually have it, wherein, because I've I've had I've been playing around with this plot for a bit of um say like the, the the big bad evil evil lord isn't really an evil lord, it's it's uh, is actually sort of the good guy. It's just propaganda from everyone else against him. But what if you had it where? But what if you had it where you had like say the big bad evil lord is with this gauntlet, actually sort of having it wherein. He's wherein he's making his country really, really good. So it's like, oh, I'm in control of the undead. Oh, you're going to use this to become a big, bad, edgy, evil guy? What? Fuck no. I'm going to use this to advance everything. Yeah, but I just say, what do you fucking mean, warfare? I'm about to become an agricultural god. <laughs> Very true. Did anyone say industrial revolution, boys? <laughs> Let's go. Revolution. Okay, guys, we're going to treat this like communism, but instead of you working and I benefit, the undead work and we all benefit, but me more than you. Yeah. System. All right, guys, we basically got every point, I think. Um, uh, when it comes to geography, sh- is there anything to talk about, like, say, with certain times of biomes or climates or, like... I'd say, so. I'd say that thing kind of got covered in environmental warfare where it easy build on an island they can't yeah. invade my island now can they <laughs> <laughs> oh. but then wouldn't you run out of undeads like once you'd make all of the undead on like all of the what do you people? mean defensively i'd build the island against the necromancer oh fair enough I was just imagining like a necromancer on an island so he's killed everything and he's got this un- all of these undead I mean then- I think it'd work either way if you wanted to like oh, huddle oh. and make your ultimate base also it's an island but you're forgetting the fact that it's an island surrounded by the ocean which have countless fish yeah fish can't walk on land you're about to get molested by the undead no, octopus how do you feel not, that line of fish not if I don't step in the ocean <laughs> <laughs> Fish can walk on land, but not with my line of thinking. I'm a necromancer. I can make anything happen. Yeah. Well, well, well. What's this? A ship coming towards me. Quick, undead whale, attack that ship. 
no, no, I respect, Actually, I respect you more along the lines of, oh, you think you could defeat me? Unleash the walking sharks! <laughs> oh, shit! Just oh, unleash the crack like, is... abominations made from multiple creatures, necromancy. <laughs> Oh, uh, this is going like the fucking pirate faction in Warhammer, the fucking vampire yep. counts pirates. Forgot their name, but that's reminding me of that. But it's like, it's just, like imagine just like release the crack in there, like the fuck you meet. Oh no, <laughs> no, well not this one again. <laughs> <laughs> but like imagine like someone just saying like release the kraken, like what do you mean kraken? Is that like a code name? No, I mean actual fucking fifty foot kraken. He's over here. I give him guns. See, you're reminding me of that of that storyline now for the uh, for Vampire Coast, where you spend the entire storyline killing this great big sea leviathan, and at the end you don't even get to control it. N you do oh. nothing with it, Bruh. You did what nothing you, with what it. Was, what was even the point to get the kill in the first place? What was the point? It's because it was. I think it was the case where the guy was going to kill it and use its power or whatnot, or like he wanted to kill it and control the oceans with it. And the idea is that throughout, throughout, throughout the campaign, you've got like this, um, the Leviathan attacking different settlements, uh, coastal settlements. But all that happens is once the campaign is complete, the, this event where it, like, the, the, the Leviathan's not attacking anybody anymore, so these just stop, but you don't control the Leviathan or you don't do anything with it. It's like, oh yeah, congratulations, you beat the game, here's an achievement and a participation award. Also, fuck you! You don't get to control the Leviathan. You don't get any kind of ability. Nothing special happening. Like you don't, you don't get, a, say, for example, an increase in movement speed on the ocean, or a removal of ocean attrition, or you don't get this, or you don't get that. It just fuck you. you, you you've, you've done it. Fuck off, bro. Sounds like a waste. Nothing but, sadder than not being able to raise a boss. Considering considering what some other factions uh, get when they complete the game, like I mean Tomb Kings for example, um yeah. It's a bit yeah, it's a bit eh. Mm. Alright guys, we're at a minute I mean, sorry, we're at an hour and a half now. Do you think we should wrap it up? Um, any 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 final thoughts on great tactics for taking out necromancers i got uh, nothing he's, a dude. he's another sure. necromancer to fight him all right i've got food so i need to quick baby oh so, no, yeah, i think I we're done now aren't we i'll take that time good timing yep yeah yeah more or less i'm not too sure what else to say because also like you could say necromancer what if a motherfucker started a cult quick baby what would, what would happen then if Necromancer started a cult and just had like, it, it, like it, it's not gonna be like a quadruple the amount or fucking like ten times the amount of undead, but it's still gonna be a lot more annoying than just one dude. Oh, it's fine. Just Making introduce that point, you get other Necromancers to fight them. I was gonna say introduce them to the concept of Jonestown. It'll be fine. They'll sort themselves oh. out. What the fuck? <laughs> Have necromancers go along the lines of drink the Kool-Aid, it'll be fine. Don't worry. No. You'll join the undead, it will be beautiful. <laughs> what, yeah, what until you that, realize what if, rise is undead. No no no, I was about to say, like, what if they just become like the most fucking powerful liches in existence? Wow. Jonestown was the secret <laughs> creation of an undead an abomination horde. He knew what he was doing. This is news to me. Jonestown, the creation of the god of death. How? He doesn't know either. It just happened. It just, negative energy just happened to cause it. <laughs> yes. Alright, guys. Thanks for joining. It was great fun. Indeed. Oh, yeah, Thanks for having amazing. me. You're welcome. Thanks for having Look forward to seeing you on the next one. For now.